I'm Bruce Reinig. I'm the interim Thomas and Evelyn Page Dean of the Fowler College of Business here at San Diego State University. And before we begin our program today, I'd like to read the Kumye Land Acknowledgement. For millennia, the Kumye people have been part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of San Diego State community, we acknowledge this legacy, we promote this balance and harmony, and we find inspiration from this land, the land of the Kumye. So it is now my honor to introduce San Diego State University President, Dr. Adela De La Torre. Dr. De La Torre became the ninth permanent president of San Diego State in June of last year and is the first woman to serve in this role. She brings nearly 30 years of service and leadership roles with institutions of higher education and is committed to student success. Under her direction, the university will pursue the highest levels of teaching, research, innovation, and collaboration excellence. Focusing on graduating exceptional global citizens, compassionate leaders, and ethical innovators who impact the San Diego, San Diego community and the world at large. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming President Adela De La Torre. Thank you, Bruce. I want to welcome all of you to the Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs President's Lecture Series. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Mrs. Chenye Hostler, who has been a steady champion for these important events, both through her influence and through her generous financial support. Presentations like these are important because they situate our focus on the combination of exceptional leadership and circumstances that render history and history in the making of today's world affairs. For example, in his book, Dr. Charles Hostler puts it this way when relating his experiences in the Persian Gulf War. I saw hard work, perseverance, and basic intelligence all contributed to success, but so did luck, so did fate. I know that today's talk by Assistant Secretary McCarthy will further expand our perspective in more ways than one. I want to welcome and thank our vice presidents, deans, and campus leaders for being part of creating a dialogue for intellectual conversations on our campus. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I want to share a brief history and significance of the Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs. The Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs plays a critical role in the educational mission at SDSU. It was founded in 1942 as the Institute on World Affairs to inform students, faculty, and the wider public on global affairs. Guided by their operating motto, let the other side be heard, the Institute has provided SDSU and the greater San Diego community with high level and spirited intellectual engagement on a rich diversity of international issues and controversies. The Institute has hosted distinguished speakers from around the world that have included ambassadors, Nobel laureates, and world leaders. The center now bears the name of the Charles W. Hostler, former U.S. Ambassador to Bahrain. Ambassador Charles Hostler endowed the Institute in 2004. Mrs. Chenier Hostler is working diligently to carry on his legacy of distinction and generosity. In fact, Mrs. Hostler recently made a significant planned gift to the Charles W. Hostler Institute on World Affairs to further honor and recognize her late husband and his legacy. The gift is intended to expand the work of the Hostler Institute to involve students in the Institute's activities, events, and study abroad scholarships so they can help continue the conversation and spread the mes message of peace building through understanding. Please join me with a round of applause to thank Mrs. Hostler for her continued generosity and visionary leadership to make the world a better place. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, 
Assistant Secretary McCarthy started her government career as an all-source intelligence analyst at the Office of Naval Intelligence and at Atlantic Fleet. Before joining the intelligence community, she served as a technical research analyst at the Institute for Defense Analysis supporting the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization. Her career has included roles in the private sector, including president of Noblesse NSP, leading its mission to serve clients in the intelligence community. She also served as chief operating officer of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and as a president of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance, which supports government policy and programs relating to cybersecurity, counterintelligence acquisition, and homeland security. As director of intelligence, intelligence operations strategy and policy for the United States Coast Guard, Assistant Secretary McCarthy played a critical role in establishing new intelligence and law enforcement collection capabilities. At the beginning of 2019, she was appointed by President Trump as the Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Intelligence and Research. She is a graduate of the University of South Carolina and holds a master's degree in public policy from the University of Maryland. Please join me with a warm welcome for Assistant Secretary McCarthy. I feel old. <laughs> Every time I hear my, my bio, I think, my, man, I really do have ADD, because I just couldn't keep a job. But, um, but no, thank you so much, um, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me here today. Thank you, President De La Torre, first woman, I can't, running SDSU. I think that's amazing um, for hosting me today. It's just been a phenomenal day. Um, and a special thank you to Ms. Hostler. We actually met in DC a few months ago. Um, you became my idol that very moment. Um, I'm gonna go into details on the OSS later, but um, I'm, ha I'm very happy that after 75 years, the OSS is what brought us together. So thank you very much for, um, for inviting me to come out here today. So as I said, I've spent 30 some years in the intelligence community. It's not ADD. It's just a real passion for the mission of the United States intelligence community. Um, I started in 1988 when given the opportunity to come back um, and run the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at State. It was, it was absolutely a no brainer. Um, to get to work again in this incredible intelligence community. But before I talk about the IC, I really want to do a shout out to San Diego State University on its exceptional international programs and students here. I got to meet a few of them earlier today. What an incredible group of people. Um, my kids are going to college that one has just started, one's on their way in, and I am so jealous. Um, I wish I could start that all over again. But, um, and I actually already called my daughter and said, hey, have you looked at SDSU? Because it actually looks really, I, I did that. I'm not kidding, I did that in the other room. Um, but your university is, is highly um, renowned at the State Department. It's recognized um, for being one of the top producing institutions for our Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, the Benjamin A. Gilman International Scholarship Program. And this university has an incredible number of students that actually participate in that program. And I think that's a real, I mean, it's a real testament to the students that you develop here, and especially the research faculty and the faculty who are training them and teaching them and, and pushing them along. So thank you, everybody, for doing that because the State Department and the country benefits from this. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I unfortunately had not gotten the opportunity to meet Ambassador Hostler, and I'm really sorry that I did not get a chance to meet him. But it turns out that he and I actually have a couple of things in common that I'd love to highlight. Um, the first connection is our history within the Office of Strategic Services, or the OSS, which were this country's first espionage agency. As I mentioned, I met Ambassador Hausler's wife, Chen Ye, at an event sponsored by the OSS Society, um, which is an organization that is um, really focused on keeping the history and the spirit of the OSS alive. And I think I share Ambassador Hausler and Mrs. Hausler's passion for the OSS and keeping that memory alive, because that's really the profession that I've spent the last 30 years working in. And it's, I, I think it's just such an, it's, it's, it's a, it's what makes the, it's one of the things that makes the United States special, and I'll get into that here very shortly. You may have heard a little bit about Wild Bill Donovan, who started the OSS, 
And I'm sure that if Ambassador Hostler didn't tell stories, he had a lot of good stories about what it was like to work in the OSS in those days. I'll tell you, the um, OSS and Wild Bill Donovan's office is right across the street from Maine State Department. I was actually just there on the other day because I wanted to check it out. It was so exciting because it looks exactly like it did at the time. And one thing I learned was when I walked into Wild Bill Donovan's office was there was a closet um, that's actually attached to his office that his secretary could get into. And if you look in the door to the closet, there's a pinhole, which means that when Wild Bill Donovan was having guests, his secretary was sitting in the office transcribing what was going on at the time. And I wonder, Ms. Hostler, did he know that? I mean, did people know when they were sitting there that they were being... <laughs> hmm. I wish I could have asked that question. I have a feeling I know the answer. Um, most people associate OSS with CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. However, the OSS actually has a much closer connection to my office, the Bureau of Intelligence Research at the Department of State. See, the OSS Research and Analysis Branch was staffed with some of the country's most brilliant historians, geographers, artists, librarians, historians, psychologists, political scientists in the mid-1980s. Their analytic work was so well regarded that when the OSS dissolved at the end of the war, the research and analysis branch was the one component that everyone agreed to be should be saved. And I'll tell you, most there was a lot of people who were not fans of the OSS in those days. So, But the research and analysis branch, um, there was. Wild Bill Donovan had a very soft spot. Um, for research and analysis. He actually, um, at the end of the war, indicated that it was really, the, much of the success of the OSS really came down to good old-fashioned intellectual sweat. And he associated that intellectual sweat with us. So in 1945, when OSS disbanded, it was the research and analysis branch that moved to the State Department. President Truman, in a letter of appreciation to the OSS director, while Bill Donovan wrote, that the transfer of research and analysis to the State Department marked the beginning of the development of a coordinated system of foreign intelligence within the permanent framework of the government. So it really all began with INR. And I'll tell you, I've already figured out what my next job is, because I do have ADD, and I think I'm going to write a book about INR, because I really have found that the history that's associated with, our, with in, or about INR is not right. Wikipedia is wrong. If you go to CIA's unclassified website, they're wrong. Research and analysis started with us. So that's why I'm here talking to you about it today. <laughs> um, so today this office exists as the Bureau of Intelligence and Research, or INR, with the only remaining continuously operating component of the Office of Strategic Services. That was 75 years ago this fall, and we plan on hosting a number of events um, that will celebrate this rich history that will, that actually I believe is a history of the, of the broader intelligence community. I believe that Ambassador Hostler would be very proud that we're celebrating this historical link and its connection to the OSS. And I, I, th I hope it's clear that I'm awfully proud of it because I've truly, um, I've only been there for a year, but out of 30 years, I truly think that this is a, a very special capability that I'm gonna talk to you about here shortly. So now what's the second connection between me and Ambassador Hostler? Well, it's the State Department. Um, in 1989, he was appointed by President George Bush Sr. as the ambassador to Bahrain, as we just heard about, during the Persian Gulf War. For many years, it was INR, and actually even to this day, INR provides intelligence support to the hundreds of ambassadors located around the world, the charges, the chiefs of mission. And so I believe that from 1989 to 1993, Ambassador Hostler was a client of my office, and I'm confident that he received great intelligence support. And again, I, would, I wish I could talk to him to get some more details on exactly how we did. Now, a lot has changed over the years, but as you can see, I'm very proud of our lineage to OSS. INR has retained so many of the characteristics of the OSS. Like when the research and analysis branch broke off to, and was sent to state, State Department didn't want us because we were people who said things that they didn't want to hear. And I'll tell you, that's still very much a part of what our cultural is today. Um, we, we actually are very proud of that model. And, and if you look back over history, when it came to things like Viet, wars like Vietnam and Iraq, um, it was INR's analysis that stood out as not being quite in line with some of the other elements within the national security framework. I mean, just today I got a phone call about a piece of work that one of our analysts did um, that may require some intervention on my part in that it doesn't exactly match with what the policymaker wants us to say. Um, writing dissents actually is very much a part of INR's um, rich history, um, but having this reputation actually to, from my optic shows that we have very high standards um, that we, and we really want to make all 
information, all relevant information that bears upon an issue available to the policymaker or to whoever needs it. Um, I actually love um, the Institute's operating model, let the, si let the other side be heard, because I actually feel like it's very much a part of INR. Um, we are, a lot of folks talk, to, talk about us as being the footnote. For those of you who know what national intelligence estimates are, we had this incredible history of writing more footnotes and national intelligence elements than any other IC entity. Um, and, and I'll tell you, I think that's just because we are who we are. It's because of our culture. It is who he is and because we're really good. Um, so I'd, I'd like to talk about the role of INR with the State Department and the intelligence community a little bit because I don't know if that's widely understood. So INR is dual-hatted. Um, we are one of the 16 elements within the intelligence community, which is led by the Director of National Intelligence, but we're also one of the 40 bureaus within the Department of State. Um, so putting a positive spin on this dual-hatted situation, we like to refer to ourselves as the State Department Intelligence Agency. It's hard to think of yourself as an intelligence agency when you're 300 people and some of your counterpart agencies are like 15, 20, 30, 40,000. But we, we pack a big punch for being such a small organization. We exist to provide intelligence at the point of diplomacy. We're one of the three all-source intelligence agencies in the IC, so our counterpart agencies are the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Central Intelligence Agency. And you might wonder, well, why do you need three? You really need to trust me, there's plenty of work to go around right now in this big bad world. But we also focus on all source analysis from different perspectives. So the Defense Intelligence Agency focuses on issues that impact US military forces. So their focus is almost entirely on the military. Whereas the Central Intelligence Agency focuses on regions, issues, and people. And of course, they're very involved in US intelligence collection through human sources. So that's CIA. At state, INR is the, is the only element that's focused entirely on diplomacy and foreign policy making worldwide. Three, these three elements, though, work very closely together. We complement one another. We don't always agree, but I'll tell you, sometimes having a little bit of overlap, having a little bit of tension in your analysis is a good thing. It yields, to, it, it yields a better product when there is some critical thinking, some, some, some debate. And, and we, work, we work very closely together in that regard. regard. As I said, INR is focused on informing US foreign policy making process around the world. Our policymaker focuses at the top with the President of the United States. Every day, INR contributes to or coordinates on special intelligence products that are incorporated into this thing called the President's Daily Briefing. So this, these are two or three, four articles that regularly are worked across the IC and are presented to the president four days a week. It's not just the president, it's actually all the senior policymakers across the national security framework. So Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of en Energy, they all get copies of the president's daily brief. I'm very proud that while INR is very small, we produce more articles for the PDB per capita than CIA and DIA. Again, I think this just shows you what what comes from just being very good, from being experts in our in our field. Um, the next level customer we have in our in our line of customers is, of course, the Secretary of State, um, and by far he is the most voracious consumer of intelligence. I was talking to some folks earlier, I view the Secretary of State as a blessing and a curse. And when I say curse, I'm joking. Um, he's a blessing because he truly loves intelligence. He gets the PDB every day. He reads it. He writes lots of questions. We get the questions back. We are providing him those answers all day long. He is an avid reader. As I said, he's getting intelligence all day long. He's a curse because he wants intelligence all day long, and he wants it, and he wants it now. You know? and, and I'll tell you, he was the director of CIA, so he truly understands what capabilities exist out there. And so he wants it, and he wants it now. And, and so we, are, we give it to him now, and we give it to him now 7 by 24. And so when I say a curse, I'm really not. It's, it's, it's exciting to have a client who's like that. But then we also have another level of customer in the State Department, and it's all the assistant secretaries and the undersecretaries who are aligned. They focus on regional issues or transnational issues or functional issues, you know, the undersecretary who deals with economics. And so we are also their intelligence support element. And so we put together, on average, 500 briefing books a week. And for those of you who are under the age of 45, when you hear that we put together briefing books, you probably are like, oh my gosh, what the heck? 
But I'll tell you, that's kind of the way we still operate. I mean, it's a very personal business. It is literally putting together a book. And I come in every morning, and I see my analyst running around. And they're delivering intelligence to their client. And I'll tell you, there's some goodness that comes from delivering briefing books. It means that you've got our analysts are sitting down with those undersecretaries and those assistant secretaries, and they're having a dialogue. You know, they're either briefing or they're reading through the intelligence, and they're talking. And so INR is gaining insights into what matters with them. And they're establishing this personal relationship that really doesn't exist in other places where the intelligence community provides support. So while it's 500 briefing books, that's a lot of trees, um, there is the benefit of that is, is the personal relationships, the understanding about what is wanted. And then, of course, we're also passing our intelligence out to the embassies worldwide um, and, and sharing across the broader national security framework. Um, so let me stop here for a second and, talk, and just brag a little bit about our analysts. I've been bragging a little bit, but I need to give you some more statistics. Um, many of our analysts have been working in that area for 17 years. Most have master's degrees or bachelor, or all of them have bachelor's degrees, but most of them multiple master's degrees or multiple PhDs. I by far am the least educated person in INR. Um, which is actually an, an, an okay thing. They speak long, multiple languages. Because they've been there so long, they really have this deep understanding of whatever area of the world. And you really don't get that in some of the other agencies. So CIA and DIA is an example. It's more like two to three years. Now, I'm not knocking CIA and DIA because the reality is is that we could not do what we do we could what we do without the expertise that resides in those other agencies. But, but it is different. Um, so that's, I mean, that's what sets INR apart. So there is a distinction I also think I should spend some time talking about between focusing on policy and supporting policy. And, and really, the INR, the intelligence community in INR specifically is not about developing policy. Intelligence is provided to inform policymakers in the policymaking process. We ensure that policymakers have all the information that the intelligence community can garner to support them in their, in their job. But that doesn't mean we're doing policy. We, are actually, we actually really strive. We don't strive. It's almost sacrosanct. There is a hard line between intelligence and policy. And, and oftentimes we'll get asked, what do you think? And the answer is, we, this is what we've got. You know, this is what the intelligence is saying. And that means that there's often times when the intelligence actually doesn't always match the policy. And, and that's OK. You know, there have been often times that intelligence is over here, policy is over here, and the outcomes we wanted were absolutely OK. But there are other times, and, and I'm happy to say that more times often than not, intelligence is informing policy, whether it's changing a communication strategy, tweaking a policy, or I'll tell you, intelligence is also very valuable in terms of telling a policymaker how is it going? You know, how is your policy working? How is your sanction working? How is, what, what are we seeing? But I think, I just, I just wanted to make sure you all understood that intelligence is but one source of information upon which decision makers use to make decisions, and it doesn't always match, and that's okay. <sighs> So I'm sure you all know, I know you all know, that the world of policymaking is not static. And the world is in increasingly complex with new issues, new players, new technologies, which constantly challenge us. I'll tell you, the one thing that has struck me um, over the course, I, 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 the course of my time in the IC is how much things haven't changed, but how much things have. I highlighted earlier today that when INR was the research and analysis branch, they had 900 analysts. Today, we have about 300 analysts. But I would argue to you, the world today is far more complex than it was in 1945. Um, but that doesn't, and, and, and I'll tell you that I'm also happy that INR is keeping up with the, is keeping up with the times. Um, and so right now, we're looking to add on new capabilities within INR, which may be of interest to you, many of you here. We've just stood up a cyber office about five years ago, five, seven years ago, that focuses on cyber issues. And we're adding an emerging threats capability to that cyber office, emerging, emerging technologies. Um, we're looking at China. We're looking at sanctions. We're looking at CFIUS. So we're, con we're, we're bringing in new capabilities that will make sure that we're constantly staying on top of this incredibly complex world to the extent that we can. Looking at ways that we can better leverage open source intelligence is also a big area of focus for, for us right now. Our work is never finished, and we continue to strive to bring together all the information we can to, to address the issues of the day. 
I'd like to mention three offices of the INR that you may not know a lot about that I think are kind of cool. Um, humanitarian issues, opinion research, and analytic outreach. So on, on humanitarian issues, we actually maintain the geographer of the United States actually resides within INR, within State Department, and affiliated with the geographer of the United States is the Humanitarian Information Unit. This unit looks at um, data visually. They, they have cartographers. They have folks who are very good at visualizing data. And they work in an unclassified realm. And they really focus on issues that are about supporting humanitarian issues. So whether it is movement of immigrants or migration or disasters, disaster relief, this, this, re this unit has been incredibly important helpful in terms of providing maps and providing real-time data to support other countries as they're, do, as they're rescuing people. And I'm, I'm, so I'm very proud of this capability. Um, the other capability we have is opinion research. And this is one, we, we are the polling research for the intelligence community. So this is actually a capability that's been around for about 40 years, but it's gotten really good with the advent of data science and data analytics. And so what we do is we actually work around the world to gain polling data. We develop the methodology. We collect the polling data. We compare it to the intelligence. And we make assessments of what's going on in other worlds, whether it's an election or how is a policy working or, or just name the problem. And it, I call it poll int because it's almost its own intelligence collection capability. And it's remarkably good. When what I love about it is it's taking open source information, it's combining it with intelligence, and it's providing it back to policymakers at an unclassified level, which whatever, if you can provide intelligence at a secret level or lower, that is going to be fantastic because most of our clients operate at that level while the intelligence community operates at a very highly classified level. Um, and the last capability I want to talk about, which is we provide, we, are the, we provide analytic outreach. And we partner with the Director of National Intelligence, the National Intelligence Council, to host about 500 events per year where we bring in experts from academia or the private sector to talk about issues that are important to ambassadors going out into the field or to undersecretaries and assistant secretaries that are struggling with a policy area. And it's about bringing in outside expertise. It's about adding diversity. It's about not looking at the world through you know, a tunnel. And I'll tell you that within the IC, we constantly need to, to be questioned. We constantly need to bring in diverse ideas. And so the fact that we do this for the IC, um, and I'll tell you, I've already collected a bunch of names from people here at SDSU um, to bring out and to help us talk about things that are important to the State Department and to the broader national security community. Okay, so I've talked a lot about INR, and I'm, obviously I'm very proud about what INR does, um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit more about the in intelligence community writ large. I've already talked about CIA and DIA, and you'll see from my bio that I've worked in a lot of places, and thank you for actually identifying all those places that I've had the incredible um, opportunity to work. Each, each place has been unique in its own way. Each place has its own technologies, its own culture, and I'll tell you, these disparate organizations work together in an incredible way. You know, so I, I was relaying my time as a Soviet submarine analyst back in the 80s. You know, we, those days we had colored pens and or colored pencils and pieces of paper where we were we were tracking, you know, Soviet submarine movements. And we'd have a, bit, a little bit of Elint, we'd have a little bit of SIGINT, we'd have a, then we'd color the pencil, and then we'd figure out what we didn't have. Um, We've gotten a little better since 1988 in terms of collecting you know, data from across those agencies. And, I, and I'm very proud at, at, at how well we are working together right now. And I just don't think a lot of people under, understand that. Um, I, I think I'd also be remiss if I didn't call out our foreign partners. You know, we have very close relationships with our Five Eyes partners and other, other countries. And I'll tell you, they help us fill in gaps in terms of our knowledge of what's going on around the world. And those relationships are almost as important as those 16 agencies that are working together like this. The private sector and academia, also critically important. I'll tell you, we spent a lot of time earlier today talking about that. I mean, I've spent some time in the private sector. And of course, now that I'm back, you know, I'm thinking, how do we, how do we bring in that knowledge? How do we bring in those capabilities? How do we bring in those, these people? But I will tell you that the one thing I'm proud of is that all these organizations, whether inside, outside, or government, what we all share is a commitment to keeping 
a service to our country and keeping Americans safe. And, I'll, and I can say that to you honestly, over 30 years, having worked in many places, we all share that common goal. So if there's anything I'd like you to take away from, from my time here today is that the intelligence and national security professionals across the spectrum are working really hard to, make, to, to protect this country. Um, they're patriots who love their country just like the OSS did. They love serving their country. They strive each day to make an impact on the future of our great nation. Yes, there are a few bad apples and sometimes bad decisions get made, but I can tell you at least from my time, um, I will promise you that you're in good hands. The people of INR, CIA, DIA, all the intelligence and national security community are truly dedicated to preserving and protecting the United States. So speaking of dedicated people, I have to take this moment to do a little bit of recruiting because we need more good people. We need to hire the next generation of intelligence professionals who love this country and are willing to take on some very hard issues. We're always looking for people to bring in. I can't tell you that it's any easier to get a job get coming into the government, but I can give you some ideas on, on what, what to do and what not to do. Um, we, we need people like students who are here, like some of the students I met today. And, and, and what I would tell you students who are sitting there right now is take advantage of the opportunities that this school is providing you. And I heard um, the focus that SDSU puts on sending you overseas and giving you overseas um, time. I will tell you, please, please, please do that. And when you come back, consider INR and the intelligence community as a place to come to work because we need people like you who, who have that global perspective. You know, and, and have whatever, whether you're studying art or liberal arts or science, it doesn't matter. You know, I think everybody's under the impression that we're only looking for STEM students. That's not true. We're looking for a broad, a broad variety, variety of people. And I think many of you are sitting in this auditorium today. We need people to carry on the tradition of selfless dedication to our country as embodied by Ambassador Hustler, his commitment to the OSS, Air Force, and State Department. And, and I think he's just an incredible example of a great American, but I promise you there's great Americans here today who are, who are continuing his legacy. So I want to thank you for taking this time with me today and for listening to me brag about INR and the IC. I want to thank you, President De La Torre, for hosting me, and especially to Mrs. Hustler, my new friend. Thank you so much. So we talked a little bit earlier about um, you know, the pivot to terrorism after 9-11, now the pivot to China, um, and how things can get overlooked by the IC when we make those big pivot pivots. So I was curious what you think might be being overlooked now by the IC, and then what INR um, can kind of do to help fill those gaps. Well, I can't really give you intelligence collection gaps, because it's pretty <laughs> 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 But I love your question. Um, but I'll tell you that, so, with the focus on China in particular, you know, if you just, as a, as a, as a government, we're going to focus everything on whatever the challenge is of the moment. That's what we do. But at State Department and INR, we talked about this a little earlier, we're a global entity. And so the reality is China is incredibly important, but so is Venezuela and so is any name a country in Africa. And also I'd argue it's not only Venezuela, it's Venezuela and China or it's Venezuela and Russia because nothing is black and white anymore. And so we have, we have only... Um, you know, we, have, we have means, and they're pretty impressive, but it's not enough to do everything. And so this is where I look at places like SDSU and actually the private sector to say, how can you, looking at open source information or looking at the world, how can you give me insights into places that are not China, not places that may be you know, top priorities of the administration, but still we need those insights. So if there are gaps, can't really say whether there are or not, but if there were gaps, how can we fill those in with creative ways of looking at um, open source data or commercial data or unclassified information or social media? So how do I maintain my focus on Guatemala? You know, and, and I'm not saying that we have issues with Guatemala, but what can you do that helps me gain insights into, into what's going on in Guatemala? So thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming today. Uh, Dan Garcia, retired Navy officer. I was uh, working in Stowe in the information operations, uh, part of the J3 directorate at PACOM a few years ago. And while I was in that assignment, I had the opportunity to visit with a good friend of mine who was the naval attache in Moscow. And while there, I got to see some of the challenges of operating in that environment back then. So my question is actually uh, twofold. Um, that is, what do you see are the challenges, uh, and how do you deal with the challenges? 
of operating currently overseas in that environment, specifically Russia, given the context of what's happening. And the second part of the question regards the challenges and dealing with the challenges of the apparent politicization of intelligence and, and how that's being uh, handled and certain individuals per, put in certain positions whose uh, qualifications may be in question. So Russia is tough. I mean, Russia was tough when you were in, and I can't tell you that it's any easier today um, in terms of an operating environment. Mm -hmm. For From INR's perspective, though, as, a, as an all-source intelligence element, you know, really gaining insights from from not just the most compartmented information, but what we're seeing in, in, in the media is incredibly important. So we're, we're able to weave this whole picture and the picture of what's the truth and the picture of maybe what is not, is, is not the truth. You know, I, I mentioned earlier today that, you know, what I find about Russia right now is that, you know, while China may be fighting for dominance, Russia's just fighting for relevance. Like they're this irritant that are just going to do whatever they can to try and, and, and mess with us, whether it's to impact a bilateral, multilateral relationship or to, I mean, they just want, you know, they're just, they're an irritant. And, you know, that's often challenging from an intelligence perspective, you know, but coming from the Cold War where, you, you know, you, you, you had the long game and you, you knew where, where to put your resources and what to target, and, and it's not quite like that anymore. So it really is looking at all sources of, of information on Russia, not, not just the most highly classified. Some of the best insights we're gaining are actually from, from the private sector right now. In terms of an operating environment, it's not, it's, I mean, you read in the paper, it's, 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 it's not a fun place. So I can't, I can't too, say too much more about it, <laughs> but I'd love to. Um, regarding the politicization of intelligence. So, I mean, I'll share with you that I mentioned that Secretary Pompeo is my boss and I give him intelligence literally all day long. And there are times that he doesn't like to see what we tell him, but he's never made us change it. He's never made us, he's never pushed back. He's never, he's never done any of those things. He's a voracious consumer of intelligence. And I mean, I think he uses it, he uses it I mean, I think he uses even the things he doesn't like. I've never seen him, I've never seen him discount the intelligence. So I have to say from my perspective working from him, I have not seen intelligence be politicized. I have said, I, the reason I focused it a little bit on this on my speech is because it's, it's something the intelligence community needs to keep its eye on. Through, I mean, throughout my career, you, know, you wanna make sure that you're always staying separate from um, from your client or your customer. I was just reflecting on my time in Navy. You know, it was when the Navy was building 600 ships and you had the Soviet Navy. And, you know, how do you, you know, how do you not get sucked into wanting to give your boss something that will help them justify 600 ships? It requires regular training. It requires, you know, regular, just being re leadership, reminding you that it's about telling truth to power. And, and that's something I'll tell you with an INR we're very proud of. Um, we've got a long history of telling truth, truth to power, and I will tell you that there's not a day that we are asked, so what do you think, and there's not a day that we have to be told no. I, I mentioned to just today, I got an email, um, one of our analysts put something out that, that a policymaker in the department doesn't like, it's, it's, it's an assistant secretary, and I, I'm going to have to go back tomorrow and we'll have to have a little sit down, but you stand by the intelligence. And then you just remind your client that you have lots of other sources upon which you can make decisions. You don't have to listen to the intelligence. You know, do what you think is best. So, um, so th I think that's how you preserve the integrity of the intelligence community. From my experience, we've, been, we've, we've had a high integrity, so I, I'm very proud to be a part of this community. All right, thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you. Let's take our next question from the back microphone, please. So if, if you go beyond just the intelligence community and you look at the spread of disinformation and what that does for the way our, our nation can deal with any piece of information in contrast to previously when I think that at once upon a time there was a lot of trust of the intelligence that made it out into the public venue. How, how do we deal with that? Are we gonna be able to overcome that amazing umbrella of disinformation that we're getting regularly? Well, you know, I do think that's where this, this partnership with the private sector in terms of understanding what are some of the tools, what are some of the capabilities that we can do that will help us, I mean, in terms of looking at the data. 
Um, I think, you know, what is, what is the strategic dialogue on, on misinformation? So I, I, I talked a little bit earlier about the Global Engagement Center, which actually is situated in State Department, but it is a multi department capability that was stood up by Congress a few years ago. And its entire mandate is to set forth that strategic message about you know, what is, what's true and what is not true. And I'll tell you that every day within State Department, it's you know, every day we're talking to the public affairs capability who's, who's, who has to ensure that the accurate message is being, is being transmitted. I actually, I'm an optimist, so yes, I believe that, I, I believe, and I believe the public is getting smarter on this. I mean, I know my 75-year-old mother still is saying fake news on every Facebook page. So, you know, my concern is now everything is fake news in her world. But um, I, I do think that we will get smarter at this in, that, in working with the private sector. But I think mostly it's our communications campaign, and it's, it's having this strategic dialogue about what's right and what's wrong. So, thanks. First of all, I want to commend you. It's, it's so refreshing to listen to a woman leader. Oh, well, you got one here. <laughs> uh, I'd like to take a different tack. Uh, I, I would like to understand, or well, I'm kind of curious as to what is the gender balance in your small, small group, right. I see, uh, INR. I think you mentioned like 300 some people. Yeah, so you could give us a historical perspective as to you know a few years ago, a few decades ago, you know what the recruitment or the population looks like, and what you what you would like for it to look like. If there's any reflection on what you're able to achieve, well, I love your question. Um, so actually, it's I actually have been looking at that within INR, and interestingly enough, the breakdown of men to women within INR is pretty close. It's like 47, 53 percent roughly. So it's pretty close. But where there's still a problem is it's at that, um, it's the medium to high grade jump. So, you know, we work in a grade structure within the civil service side of the house. So we're, we're very balanced at the lower grades. But as you start getting up into the 14, 15 level, it's not balanced at all. And then when you talk about diversity, actually the, the data is not, is even worse. And so one thing I'm doing within INR is we are the, so I've told you there's 16 intelligence agencies, and all of them have direct hire authority, which is an incredibly important capability. So within the intelligence community, you need people with specialized skill sets, with specialized backgrounds. You know, and not only do they have to have those specialized skill sets and backgrounds, but you also have, they also have to be willing to go through background investigations, polygraphs, you know, all, all this other level of, of of review that most other folks don't have. And so the fact that INR is the only intelligence element right now that doesn't have the authority to hire directly is a problem. And I think it partly reflects why we are where we are. So especially now as I talk about recruiting more people who understand emerging technology and cyber and CFIUS and sanctions, I mean, those are people that you're not gonna find you know, easily. It, it means I have to come to places like this and I have to be able to recruit and I need to get a resume that I think looks really great and say, I want you and bring you in. And that's actually gonna help with, it's not just a diversity in terms of nationality, but it's also diversity in terms of skill sets. We're not, we're, we're kind of far off. So I'm, I've actually, got, I've just been given direct, actually the, the State Department supports getting it. We're going to go over to OPM and have this discussion, but um, I think that's going to take us far to help fix that problem. But it's, it's still a problem. So thanks. Yeah. Let's take our next question from the back microphone, please. Hi, actually my question relates to the diversity and skill sets. So basically coming from a student's position, I think I'm a political science major and I think a lot of my colleagues are as well. And a lot of our questions come in going into a federal agency or capacity. What is a way to diversify our experiences to be a better asset to a federal government position? Yeah, I, I was just talking a book that I just read. It's, and I can't remember the author. I think it's Phil Hart something. But it's called Fuzzies and Techies, How Fuzzies Will Take Over the Digital Universe. And the, um, the bottom line in this book is, is that, that, that liberal arts, social science majors are probably, in, in, in this person's estimate, more comfortable with technology than technologists are with the liberal arts. And so as a liberal, so as a social scientist or a liberal art, arts major, if you can understand the technology, understand the capability, speak smartly about what's going on, that's going to set you apart. I actually think that we're raising a generation of pe people who already are comfortable with technology, so I, 
I think I'm not so sure about the premise of this book, though I love the premise of the book because I'm a liberal arts major. Um, but I think anything you can do to be comfortable with technology is going to set you apart. Languages, travel, get out, travel, get get outside experiences. I'll tell you, I had, I, I, again, I had lunch earlier today with some folks. The other thing I would highly encourage people who are looking to come into the community is don't be afraid to come in from the business side of the community. So don't be afraid to take a job in HR or to take a job doing budget or take a job doing acquisition. So the business side of, of national security is incredibly important. You know, the reality is, is that the, the tools and resources we have right now are not being driven by analysts, although they should be. They're being driven by people who understand acquisition. And not all of our acquisition experts have any idea what the mission is doing right now. So we're getting stuff that doesn't actually help anybody do anything. I mean, that's, I've gone to, when I was working in the private sector, I've gone to agencies that said, don't sell me one more tool. My analysts don't want it. And I get it, okay, so, because you just, you're inundating these folks with tools and they don't know how to use them. They don't have the time to do it. They've got to write intel intelligence. So what I'm suggesting is if you're trying to get a job in the government and there's an opportunity for you to gain some understanding of the business side, by the way, that's a great way to get in because the government is always looking for people who, who can work HR acquisition or resources. You do it for two or three years, you gain some incredible experience, and then transition to the analysis side. You know, I, I, I have tons of interns that I say, if you get a job in the PAO of NSA, you take that job. But I want to be fighting terrorists. No, take the PAO job in NSA. Go learn how to communicate. Learn how to message. Transition to an all-source analysis job. Because once you're in, moving around is so much easier. It's getting that first leap in. So for you, I would say, comfortable with technology, understand the business understand how the budget works, understand how Congress works. That'll Thank help, thanks. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, what emerging technologies is INR leveraging in order to do the job of 3,000 with a 300-man staff, man and woman staff? So, you know, I describe INR as post-Mad Men in terms of its technical sort of genre. <laughs> um, you know, we, we, we so, I, so, I, so again, I highlighted that INR was 900 people in 1945, but 300 people today. How did it get that way? Um, I, I would say that it gets back to my last discussion, which is um, they've had a series of phenomenal, my predecessors have been experts in their field. They are renowned across, this, across the community, either as foreign service officers or analysts who truly understand their region. But it's understanding the business side of intelligence as well. It's understanding how to, how to better leverage Congress to, to bring in the capabilities that INR needs. I'll tell you, INR has succeeded based on its people and its relationships. I mean, what, I, what makes INR special is it's the relationship with the policymaker, it's their small size, and it's their deep expertise. So when we talk about what tools do we need to bring in, they have to be tools that don't break that. I, you know, I, I want those personal relationships. I want to stay small and agile, and I want people who are going to stay in their job. I'll tell you, that's an area that I'm actually very concerned right now with the next generation. Nobody stays in one seat for 17 years and studies Guatemala. So what are the things that I can do that makes it good for these folks to stay in? And I think it's building our capacity a little bit so I can offer sort of people opportunities to do overseas assignments to do rotations in other agencies, to potentially go off and get another degree. Those are the things that actually make people stay. Um, the self-actualization that comes from getting feedback from your client, INR gets, that's one reason why they stay. That doesn't happen at a lot of other agencies. I started at Office of Naval Intelligence and left because I'd write all these things that I never knew well, how, you know, I'd never know who read them. And then I went down to Sinclair Fleet and I was writing message traffic and I was getting feedback immediately. This worked, this didn't work. And I think I like that. So, so we already get that. So, so getting back now to your question about what tools do we need? It's the things that makes the analyst life easier. It's the things that, um, it's, 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 it's organizing data in a way that's usable and that they trust it. It's, it's being able to provide visualization capability and maps that make it easier than the way they have to do it right now. Um, so right now, it's very manpower intensive. You want a map, you walk to, to GGI, somebody sits down and, and develops a map. I know there's other ways to do this. I worked at NGA. So it's, it's things that will help our analysts save time. And, and it has to be things that they've developed with 
the person who has that capability. So it's about bringing in folks who, who have these technical capabilities but can sit down with my analysts and help them understand how to get through diplomatic reporting more quickly. So it's anything that can make my analyst's life better, and it's not to scare them away. <laughs> Thanks. OK, next question. Thank you for your service, first of all. I'm absolutely amazed that a woman with such moxie is it's just yeah. awesome to see you there. <laughs> so it's a true inspiration for me. Thank I am you. also, I teach uh, information systems at certain places, and so I'm trying really hard to send you cybersecurity people. I talk about it every day in class, and I'm glad to hear that you've actually created a whole department just on cybersecurity. That is, so, but my question, I have so many, but my question is actually, um, has social media made it harder to do your job in the intelligence? And I'll have to tell you, a lot of what you said today kind of went over my head, because I'm not I'm from sorry, the intelligence just, yeah, department. Yeah. I'm trying. You know, it's hard, I'm old. <laughs> True to yeah. disclosure. But I'm just wondering, like, you know, just as a consumer of news and fake news and social media and Twitter and all these things that are going on that we all know about. Is it, is it harder to do your job or? Y yes, it is. But I'll tell you, so, you know, on the fake news piece, because I've been asked this a couple of times. So, so the one thing that sets intelligence apart from social media is we actually corroborate every source we get. So I, I should have said this right up front. So when you get a piece of intelligence, when you get a raw report, you're not just sharing it with the president. You actually are taking the time to ensure that it's true or it's not true, or you're matching it with a, you're trying to validate it. You're trying to, and, and I'll tell you that the one thing that happened post 9-11 was the intelligence community's ability to vet data changed tremendously because the tempo upon which we had to push intelligence out was so much faster. You know, during the Cold War, it was easy. You, know, you could take time developing an analytic product and, and sharing it. You could take a few days, maybe a few months. But that changed with 9-11 with and the war on terrorism because now you needed to get that intel out quickly. But, and so there, I mean, there were times I'd actually sit at meetings and I couldn't believe that stuff was being shared at the most senior levels because it had not been corroborated with any other source. But the reality is part of our tradecraft is as analysts is that you don't just put, push out one piece of information without ensuring that it's accurate to the best of all the sources of information you have. So when we look at uh, misinformation, what makes it harder is there's just more of it. There's just more junk. And so this gets a little bit to your question about what tools do we need in INR. It's whatever tools can help us clean out the junk. And you know, some of that can be done just with good data analytics. You know, it, a lot of it already can. Or, because, because data analytics is all about matching data. So if you have five pieces of bad data but 10 pieces of good data, you can make an assessment on what's true and what's not true. So this is the kinds of tools. What can help us get through lots of data and, and provide you know, a pretty good sense that, that the data is correct? So, and, and I'll tell you, it's already within the anal analyst's day-to-day -day operation to ensure that this is something I'm going to share with my customer or my client. So the harder part is just how much of it there is. Now, social media actually is an incredibly valuable source of information. Mm. You know, because it's on the ground reporting. And you know, if you, you know, the, the reality is that social media provides, it's, it's, it's crowd, it's, it's, it's group data, it's, 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 it's very valid information. It's a great indicator of things that we need to look at more. So, you know, if we're seeing, you know, a hot spot, uh, name your South American country where there's a lot of um, angst right now, social media is a great cue to say, okay, let's look at, uh, let's look at the intelligence to see what's going on. So we like that, actually. Good. Do, right. Thank thanks. you. Thank you for your yeah. service. Appreciate it. You mentioned the 80s using pencils and pens oh, and it stuff. It was my favorite. It was a good old days. In the 70s, <laughs> I, feel, I think we were interpreting and intercepting smoke signals. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was very fascinating work, um, although I went a different direction in career-wise. Ever since then, I've always been interested in seeing it. And when things happen, what was going on behind the scenes? What was happening in the intelligence community? And sometimes I think the intel, not sometimes, most of the time I feel the, the IC gets short shrift, is, gets a bad rap, uh, and it needs a good PR person, which would be, kind of be an oxymoron right. for the IC to have PR. Uh, but do you feel that 
adversely affects or affects the people working in the IC, the, nobody sees what they do, basically. Yeah. Um, and that can really have an, I would think, have an effect on them. So, I mean, I will tell people who are looking for jobs in the intelligence business, if you need an attaboy, it's not the place no. to come. Because you very rarely get a good job. You know? um, but, you know, there's a lot of intelligence failures. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, or perceived intelligence failures. You know, I would argue that a lot of those intelligence failures have just been that you haven't accepted the intelligence. That's not to say that we're always right, though. So I, I'll tell you, there's lots of times we're not right. We're working on the data we've got. We're giving the best assessment of what we know based on our experience and based on, based on the data we have. I think you want the intelligence community to flow below the radar. I mean, I, I think that's a good thing. I think the problem is, is about what are the ex, what are the, what are the Americans' expectations of the IC? So you hear things about, you know, we're we're tapping into everybody's phone. You know, my daughter's convinced that I can follow her based on what I do at work, and just completely not true. But I do know where she is because I'm a mom, and uh, <laughs> so. Uh, but, the, but, but we, we're constantly fighting, we're not fighting, but that's constantly the pressure that you hear. You know, the, the intel community is doing this, or we're doing that, or we're doing this. I will tell you that that's just not been my experience in the 30 years that I've been in. We're doing the best we can, we've made mistakes, we try our best, flying below the radar is a good thing. For us, the best day is when somebody actually takes what we've given them and uses it, and it's gotten the outcome that they've wanted. And that, that, doesn't, that gets no better than that. If that's what you love, then, then you're gonna love working in the IC. You know, I, I, I think back on my junior days when you know, I'd be sending messages out to units, I was a sub-analyst, and you know, they'd come back with a report and they'd say, because of this, we did this. You never had a better day. But you also had those days when you got yelled at. You know, I, this is stupid, I don't like this, blah, blah, blah. And you, and you just, you know, you, it's, part of the, it's part of what you do. And so in terms of how is the intelligence community, I think right now what we've got right now is you've just got, it's more open. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, you've got blogs, you've got the social media, you've got the press, you've got, I mean, it's just so much more pervasive. You know, the movement of news and information is so much more pervasive. So, you know, I, I mentioned earlier today, I struggle so many times between what I see in the news and what I'm doing when I go to work every day. You know, I'll have the, the television on and I'm doing this and I'm thinking, wow, you know, I, I'll have people who walk up to me and they say, Ellen, how are you? As if I'm gonna say, gosh, it's horrible. And, life is bad. I am blessed to be running one of 16 intelligence agencies right now. We're doing the best that we can, and the people are as phenomenal today as they were in 1988. And I hope a few of you will look at this as a possible career, because it really is amazing. I'm not just saying that. It is amazing. So, thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. It's uh, been very informative, and I appreciate your coming here today to my old alma mater. Um, this is kind of a, a question about how credible is the information coming out of China relative to the coronavirus, and can we believe the number of cases, or is it growing exponentially? That yeah, you know, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you asked a hard question. Um, I, can we believe the data that's coming out of China on the coronavirus? I, no, I mean, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I, mean I, I will tell you that, um, but the data on the coronavirus, I'll tell you that's one area where INR is actually providing a lot of support in right now. And it's based on some of our geographical capabilities and it's working with the private sector. And I, I, I will say that, you know, there's a lot, we're, we're looking at a lot of data sources right now, we're bringing together, and we're making the best estimate we can at the unclassified, at the unclassified level. So I, you know, I think I think you you look at what what they're reporting right now, and you have there has to be, you know, a factor of some number that's going to change change that number. So, most of, interestingly, most of those most of those numbers are completely open source. So, okay, we have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Nika. Um, I am part of the Human Dynamics in the Mobile Digital Age. Um, laboratory and the AI lab as well. Um, I am very impressed by how you are handling everything. So I would like to ask, what is the method to your madness? Do you have a method of organization that works for you? 
I just find that when I see a lot of successful people, I want to understand what helped get them there as far as, you know, being able to manage your time and your tasks and things like that. So I think you surround yourself with a great team. And it doesn't matter where you fall in an organization, by the way. It, it, it doesn't matter whether you're just starting out or you're just finishing up. And you surround yourself by a diverse team. So you want to surround, or any of you, you don't have your own team. You want to have advisors that are not like you. So critical feedback is just so incredibly important. And, and again, that doesn't matter where, where you are in, in your career. So somebody who can tell you honestly about what you're doing or what you're thinking or have you thought about it this way, you know, that's, that's I mean, that's so from a professional perspective, that's something that you want throughout your entire career. It actually gets harder as you get more senior because fewer people are willing to tell you critically what's going on. That fewer people are willing to come to me as the assistant secretary and say, that was stupid, Ellen. And I still need that. I mean, I needed that when I was starting as a submarine analyst, and I need that today. So having, those, having, those, having a network, something else I talked about a little earlier is, I'll tell you, for me, um, and I think this is more a women than a man thing, but having a network of friends or associates or a village that you can go to when you're having a bad day and, and talk it out is very important. Having a family that supports you, you know, so I'll tell you that um, I would never be here if it wasn't for my family. Actually, it was a very sad weekend this weekend because my nanny of 16 years passed away suddenly on Saturday. And so I will tell you that I absolutely could not have done what I've done had it not been for this woman who helped me raise my children. And so, and it doesn't have to be a nanny, it can just be whatever your decision is, whether you're taking care of parents or friends, but you know, having that network is just so critically important. Um, you know, then, then understanding the priorities of your organization helps a lot. You know, you need to know what your boss cares about most, and that helps you prioritize what's, what's most important during that day. I think having a sense of humor is crazy important because, and being able to laugh at yourself, and I'll tell you, I think that's what's gotten me through so many things. Um, you know, and having a solid plan B. I, I will say I've joked before that, and this is not a joke, it's the truth. I started as a waitress and a bartender, and I have approached every job with the, if this doesn't work out, I can always go back to waitressing and bartending. Because <laughs> I'm really good at it. I made a lot of money, I loved it, I love people, I love its, its connections with people. And, but, but in all seriousness, having a plan B means that you're maybe willing to take on a little bit more risk than you would have otherwise. So you're not just cranking out the donuts, you're thinking about new ways to make donuts or, or new opportunities or have you thought about this, thinking ahead, being proactive. One thing that I hate more than anything is people who do not think ahead, you know, who just every day come in and do, it and do what they do. So long answer to a short question, but those are the things that work for me, I think. We'll let you know. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for those answers to those questions. So I would like to ask uh, Assistant Secretary McCarthy back up to the stage, if you would, please, and President De La Torre and Mrs. Hostler. We have a couple presentations uh, following the, the Q&A session. So uh, I would like to present the secretary with the presidential medallion for her wonderful achievement and success and for coming today to share her wonderful um, information, but also her guidance too, because I know there are a number of students here also who look at her as an aspiration, uh, as a future, um, in a way that they can explore their own future. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, first, I would like to express my sincere thanks to President De La Torre for her kind remarks and her strong support to the Charles Hostel Institute on World Affairs. As an Aztec myself, um, I'm very eager to help my university thrive and the students succeed. Um, I like uh, Assistant Secretary said, I met her at the OSS uh, Society event last October in Washington, D.C. And um, 
I was absolutely delighted when she immediately said yes to my request for her to speak at this lecture series. Um, Charles landed on Normandy on D-Day, that's June 6, 1944, as a member of OSS, which is the predecessor of I I INR. Um, Charles uh, recognized the, the, the value of this significant institution where students, faculty, and community members can come and learn from distinguished statesperson like Assistant Secretary Ellen McCarthy. We're very honored to have her here and to, able, to be able to listen to her um, insightful and, and informative lecture. I would like to present her um, Charles' mem uh, memoirs, uh, Soldier to Ambassador, which was published by San Diego State University. So we would like to now, Bruce and I would like to present a small gift to Mrs. Hostler for her incredible support um, to the Hostler Institute and to this wonderful series. Um, and so we want to share this, this uh, bracelet with a globe on it to, again, show her commitment to creating the type of place where collaboration conversation and communication about global issues will be sustained for decades to come. So thank you, Chen Ye. Oh, thank you very much. Can you take a photograph real quick? Can you write over here? Just the four of us real quick. 